well, thank you, thank you for the introduction, Ethan. And um, yeah, once again, I, I encourage you all to to check out the Backyard Birding Blitz this Saturday. Um, again, it doesn't matter where you live. Um, if you don't have a backyard, there's there's categories. If if uh, if you're up in you know if you're in a in a condo, uh, there's there's ways you can still participate. Um, and uh, it's going to be a, a fun a fun global event. Uh, that we're excited about. Um, so this program today is going to be quite a bit different from the weekly wildlife series I was mentioning earlier, um, which is normally Friday mornings at 9 a.m. Uh, those will begin again next week um, and presumably weekly until somebody tells me to stop. So um, I encourage you to join for those Friday morning chats over coffee. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we're, we hear incredible stories about the common and ordinary neighbors in our backyards. Um, today's going to be a little bit shorter and is really it's today's lecture is really meant for someone who is brand new to birding or in the early stages of birding um, but I often benefit from revisiting these basics um, so there might be some good information uh, for those that have a, a, a good amount of experience birding too. Um, I'll start by giving a, a top 10 list of tips that I have to make your birding experiences more enjoyable and and maybe more impactful. Uh, and then I'll run through a top 10 list of some of the very common birds uh, that you likely find around your house um, or in your neighborhood uh, this time of year or pretty much any time of the year. All right, so. Um, so you may have picked up on, on the theme of lists. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why someone might go out and look for birds, um, but for many it, it has to do with these lists. Uh, people often enjoy the listing aspect of birding um, and are excited to build a list of birds that they've personally seen. It's fun to reach milestones milestones uh, with numbers or milestones with rare birds and for me birding started really kind of as an obsession and I just enjoy checking those boxes. There's something really satisfying and cathartic about it like scratching an itch um, but then of course you still have all those empty boxes of birds you haven't seen that that really drive the anticipation of um, future experiences. So you can kind of visually see your progress with lists. And uh, again, the, the, the beauty is you really can create all kinds of lists. You don't just have that one list. You can have lists for your backyard, lists for your county, for your state, a January list, uh, a country list, a list of, a list of birds that uh, are, um, I don't know, visiting your feeder or um, lists of birds in your country, your hemisphere, your planet. Um, you can have lists for other states, uh, other countries, other planets. So um, I, I consider listing an important part of birding because at its core, anytime you're creating a list, you're monitoring for birds and creating data points, so an offshoot, um, but really an important part of the scientific research. Uh, so careful observations of what you see and where, and those data are useful. Um, to you and to the people you share them with. Um, and as I mentioned, if you're participating in the Backyard blit Blitz, your list, no matter how many birds are on it, is your entry ticket uh, for the door prizes. Um, so I will, with this and this theme of lists, I will move on to the, my top 10 lists, uh, list tips, excuse me. Um, so tip number one, keep a journal. I, I I strongly encourage keeping a journal for any naturalist, no matter what you're observing in nature. Um, and from a research point of view, this means keeping track of your place and time and space. Um, if you record, try your best to record a date, a time frame, and a location. Uh, I also encourage journaling in a lot of different aspects of your life, but, but for someone learning about the natural world, this is maybe the most important piece of equipment. Uh, journals are great not only for listing birds you've seen, but you record weather conditions, what's happening in your surroundings, what's happening in your mind, and other information, uh, which, which may not seem important now, but you never know what you're gonna wanna look back on later. Um, and I, I could get caught in this journaling rabbit hole for a long time, but we're specifically looking at birding. Um, so I'll move on to tip two. Birds are fleeting, watch them. and. By this, I mean really prioritize looking at the bird. Uh, this may seem like a strange or obvious tip, but 
But once you key in on a bird, really watch that bird. Um, it's very easy once you find a new bird to immediately want to open your field guide and try to flip through your, your guide and, and try to find that bird and put a name on it. Um, but the, the book will always be there. The bird may only be there for a little while. So really try to burn that image into your brain um, of that bird, which brings us to tip number three. Um, it, it helps to kind of learn what to look for. If you do this well, after you've really gotten a good look at the bird, or even if the bird just, just took off after a few seconds, um, you do have your, your trusty journal to jot down the notes. Um, if the bird is cooperating and you've really had a chance to look at it, start sketching what you saw. Um, there, there are some talented sketch artists out there. I'm not one of them. None of my bird sketches are going to be framed, but, uh, but the little sketches I do can be very important. Um, so I'm not going to go over all the characteristics to look for in a bird because there's plenty of beginning bird resources out there um, that can help with that. But, but you, you probably know the basics. Your, your mind would go to, you know, certain things like colors and field marks. Um, things that are kind of easy to classify and often can be important. So did the bird have a white ring around the eye? Um, did it have white bars on the wings? What color is the breast? What color is the tail? Uh, color is under the tail. Um, what color is the bill? And those things can change seasonally on and on. Uh, this bird is a hermit thrush and, and the way you're able to identify it from the other cathartist, cathartist thrushes is this that, that tiny bit of rustiness on the upper patch of that raised uh, tail. Um, and and if, if, if you don't see that, it's, it's, uh, it's not a hermit thrush. There's, there, there's other things, and, and thrushes can be pretty hard to identify. Um, so if you kind of know what to look for, um, and you'll hear me say this over and over again, once you start to be familiar with the birds, you start to, to know a little bit more about what to key in on. Um, and, and, I, and I say this a little tongue in cheek because these characteristics, these field marks are very important and they're low hanging fruit. Um, but to me, the most important characteristics uh, don't have to do with these field marks. What you're gonna try to do is you're gonna try to rec recognize the bird. And to illustrate this point, I'm gonna show you two non-bird photos. All right, so this is Mike and this is Glenna. They're, they're two good friends and colleagues that work at the Urban Ecology Center. Uh, if one of them were to visit my desk, my brain tells me immediately who it is because I recognize them. That's what I mean when you try to recognize the bird. So, so I don't have to pop open my field guide to coworkers and say like, okay, let's see. Let's look at the size, the shape, the color of the hair, the color of the eyes, the proportion of the arm length to the leg length. They're the the shape of the nose uh let's see let's say oh okay it's mike i'll um or maybe it's glenn i don't know the lighting's kind of poor so that we we don't do that um with people we know uh, although it would be hilarious um and and the goal is to try and not do that process with birds either so you're really just trying to recognize the birds um really, really look at some, some birders will call this the general size and shape of the bird. And, and that's kind of what you do with your friends. Um, but I'll, I'll turn to an actual bird example here. If I see a raptor flying a tree near me and I'm at Washington Park, I know chances are good that it's either going to be a red tail hawk or a Cooper's hawk. So if we suspect red tail hawk, the first thing we look for is what the red tail, right? Um, but, uh, Red tails actually don't have a red tail when they're young. It's something they get when they're older. So if you're looking at a red tail and say, oh, that's not a red tail. It doesn't have a red tail. Um, that's, that's not going to work. And you're going you're gonna to get the idea wrong. So uh, what I look for if a raptor comes near me is I see, okay, well, what is the shape and size of this bird? Um, size can be really hard because of the effect of distance and other things. So um, when I look at this bird, I see a kind of a barrel chested bird, kind of buffed out at the breast, skinnier at the legs, kind of, kind of stocky and chunky. Um, uh, and, and if I start to notice that, it makes it easier to identify if I'm in the field with, with poor lighting or I have a poor look or the, the weather is not good or it's, it's, it's at a distance. 
and this indeed is a red-tailed hawk, but if it's this bird, um, I immediately see that it's more of a sleek looking bird. Uh, so like if the red-tailed hawk is like a lion, the, the, the Cooper's hawk would be more like a cheetah. Um, it's, it's, it's more like kind of tube shaped. Uh, and it, it makes sense. Red-tailed hawks are strong, powerful predators that catch their prey out in the open with using you know brute strength and surprise with their, their powerful talons. And, and Cooper's hawks rely more on stealth uh, they maneuver around tight corners to catch their prey by surprise. Um, and, and, and you can kind of see that character and how their body's built. So if, if, if you're looking for that more than like, you know, what are the colors of the, the bars on the tail or the shape of the tail, things can get really confusing. Uh, this makes it actually much easier if you're focusing on those things to, to, uh, to get down the right path, um, for identification. So, yeah, try to try to really recognize um, the the bird based on on those you know same characteristics. Um, you, then you combine that with things like you know where's the bird located and what's it doing, which are also really fantastic characteristics that not only help with ID but understand a little bit more about how the bird functions. Um, so you know, is a bird in a tree or on the ground? Is it if, if it's in a tree, where is it in the tree? Is it near the top or the bottom? Is it near the trunk? Is it out in the branches? Is it is it sallying forth to catch flies? Is it pumping its tail? Uh, is it if it is it creeping on the trunk looking for insects? And if so, is it moving up the trunk like this ground, ground creeper on the left, or is it moving down head first like the nuthatch on the right? Um, so those are those are the things that that really help key in on a bird. Uh, if the bird's in the water, is it diving under the surface, like this merganser on the left? Um, or is it just putting its head underneath the surface, surface and putting its butt in the air like the mallards on the right? So these, these clues are, to me, way more important and fun to learn uh, than the physical field marks that, that we all tend to go to right away. Um, but probably my absolute favorite bird characteristic to become familiar with um, is their songs. The majority of birds that I find in the park are birds that I usually hear first and see second. So if there's a weak kind of high pitched squeak in the nearby bushes, there, it might indicate there's a kinglet or a brown creeper in there. If I hear kind of a powerful repetitious call, it might, my brain might say, look for a woodpecker. If it's a cacophonous, amorphous, atonal, amusical squawk, um, then we'll look for a heron. Uh, and, you know, you, 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 incidentally, you can draw sounds in your journal too. Uh, you know, you can draw, if, is, it, is it tonal? Then maybe you'll draw a line. If it's, if it's chattery and squawky, you might indicate that with more of a fuzzy pattern. Um, if it's going up or down, is it repetitious? Is there a long pause? There, there are a lot of creative ways to draw songs as well. I encourage you to, to, to try that out, um, even without much knowledge of the physics of acoustics and, and some of those patterns. Hey Tim, um, it looks like we have a raised hand. Absolutely. Um, if you could type the question in the in the chat. You can also unmute if you want, just want to ask the question. How do I do that? Oh, I see. Okay. We'll try that. Yeah, it looks like from Rebecca's iPad. Uh, I'll, how about I move on and then once you get that um, in the chat, you can... Sounds good. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I was, I was talking about like, you know, there's, there's really good ways to draw songs and that's really helped me sometimes. When I do have time later, I, I get back from birding and I've, I've got my journal and I've and, and my field guides um, and then it's a you know I, I can kind of that'll help me look at the description of the bird song and listen to some songs and 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 that can help so um, plus learning songs are fun um, they, they provide some really interesting mnemonics and for whatever reason a lot of the bird mnemonics have to do with food 
uh, particularly cheese and beer, but you, you kind of learn what other, uh, what other people, so, so mnemonics are basically taking a bird song or bird call and putting words to it to help you remember it. So you learn what other people think birds say, um, like who cooks for you? Uh, please, 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 please to meet ya. Uh, this one says maids, 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 put on your tea kettle, let a little. And uh, the indigo bunting says, uh, fire, fire, where, where, here, here, put it out. Um, so it's, it's fun to make up your own. And, uh, and my friend Chad Tomac, another coworker, uh, the, the best mnemonic we had for the red winged blackbird before I met Chad was, was they say conqueree, which is descriptive. But when you hear red winged blackbirds, they're usually up on a, uh, a, a, in a grassy area. And they're, and they're singing that song, trying to attract mates to their harem. And so Chad said, oh, what he's really saying is vote for me. And so that worked. That's, that's what I and a lot of others now use for the, the red winged blackbird. Um, so if you, if you kind of take those last few tips, um, if, if you find a bird, really look at it, make sketches, record its behavior, its location, anything that comes to mind. And then if you really want to put a name to it, which we all end up doing, you know, there's, there, there are a lot of great resources for bird ID. Um, my next tip is to practice, practice and keep practicing. And, and it, it can be, it can easily be frustrating um, to start this process. If you go out to a park for the first time, like today in the middle of May, um, you could be completely overwhelmed. There could be 50 or 60 different species in your immediate vicinity. And uh, that might be a terrible time to, to try to put names to all those birds. It would just be very overwhelming. So usually I, I tell people the best time to start learning bird ID is the middle of winter um, because there's just a lot fewer birds, you have a lot fewer choices, and, um, and so it, it just makes it simpler. Um, and incidentally, that's another good tip for IDing is, is knowing what time of year uh, the birds are there or should be there and where they should be. Um, and that's where field guides really do come in, handing, in, hand, in, come in handy uh, because, you know, you could say, oh, this is this bird. But then you look at its range and it's, it's not even in North America or something like that. It might be in or, or southern North America or Mexico or something like that. So kind of knowing where birds should be and when they should be um, there is, is, a, is, a, is another good key. And eBird is a really good uh, resource for that. Um, so I encourage you to uh, check out Ethan's eBird lectures, uh, either the ones he's already recorded or the ones he's going to be doing um, this afternoon. Um, another thing you could do is you know, just, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm really going to focus on woodpeckers today, or I'm really going to focus on ducks today, or, or, or I, you know, even I'm just not going to worry about IDing the birds today. I'm just going to go out and watch and see what they're doing and, and record uh, their behavior in your mind, record it in your journal. Um, so that's, that's something I encourage you to do too. Uh, the next tip, uh, go birding with someone else. If you're a beginner, and I guess I should say for now, if you're not in your quarantine group, uh, maintain a healthy distance. But uh, if you're birding with someone else, if you're a beginner, uh, a lot of it's, it's really, it's, it can be great to find somebody who knows a thing or two and you really learn from them. Um, but I also think it's just as fun to find another beginner and, and to learn that process together. I think both of those are equally valuable. Um, so, uh, I, I would, I would say that a lot of people that bird at the urban ecology center programs are, are social birders. Um, they're, they're, they enjoy the birds, but they also enjoy each other's company. Um, and, uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of benefits, um, to, to doing that. Um, also get, get to know your surroundings, uh, we all we, we already know about the health benefits. We can kind of quantify the health benefits of being outside. Um, but especially now, I encourage you to really get to know a place and, and in particular really getting to know your own backyard or your local park. Uh, being in the same place over a period of time, you really start to see patterns. 
of, of which, which birds show up in the morning, which ones come in the afternoon, where they show up. Uh, you start to pay attention of the plant, you know, with the plants, what's budding and blooming, um, what are they doing. Uh, right now, I have an important part of my driveway, uh, which is, is kind of sandy, that there's about seven or eight little house sparrow pockets in there that, that they've created because house sparrows really like to take dust baths. Um, you know, or having wor water for bird baths. Uh, or what are they eating in your yard? Um, are they eating berries? Are they eating insects? Uh, are they finding shelter? Are they eating worms like robins? Um, you start to notice these things the more you pay attention. Um, I also do have to say that if you like watching birds, um, bird feeders are a great educational opportunity and uh, people have studied the effects of bird feeders on birds and uh, so far to the best of my knowledge um, bird feeders don't really hurt birds um, and then on the flip side they don't really help them as much as we'd probably want like to think they are so uh, I think from an educational standpoint and from an enjoyment of your yard standpoint uh, bird feeders are, are excellent and, and I think knowing that they're not harming birds is, is important for that. Um, but if you really, I should say, and if you really do want to help your birds, the number one thing you can do in your yard is to plant native species. Um, because birds, all of the birds, even the ones that we think just only eat seeds, at some point in their life, particular when they're raising young, they need insects. They need that protein. Even hummingbirds uh, need to find insects. So by planting native species, in your backyard, you are building up that invertebrate uh, base that all wildlife really need. Um, so, you know, I, I would say unless you can really, uh, you know, if, if you have a lot of money and you can buy habitat and turn it into a preserve, maybe that's the best thing you could do. But I think most of us can't do that. So there's a lot of research, a lot of evidence that just the work that you do in your, in, even in a small backyard, um, really, really helps. So, uh, Jim, you know, we that... have a couple of questions here. Oh, good. Um, first question, uh, I live in Bayview, a couple blocks from Lake Michigan. One of my neighbors described the lake adjacent corridor as a bird superhighway. Is that true? And which birds are more likely to use that highway? So th there's, there's a couple of interesting patterns that Lake Michigan causes for us. Uh, a, a lot of birds at migrate at night. A lot of our familiar migrants um, migrate at night and you can actually track their migration by looking at at weather radars. They'll, they'll, they'll pick up bird movements and people can kind of predict when a big, a big movement of, of birds is coming through. Um, and it's usually in the morning uh, that you start to see them because they're traveling at night um, and it's usually after a, a big front came through, a cold front or a warm front depending on the season. And then you have what's called a fallout. Well, when these birds are migrating at night, uh, there's evidence that just before the sun rises, they actually, whatever level they're flying at, they actually fly higher, presumably because they're kind of scanning the area to look for a good place to land before the daytime predators come out. They can't usually make their migrations in one big uh, journey. They have to make several uh, stops, which is, um, and stopover ecology is very important. But any bird that's over Lake Michigan is going to have to find a coastline to land on. And so uh, there's a thought that in Ohio and Wisconsin and Michigan, that you do get this, this concentration of migrants along the coast for that reason. Um, there's also uh, a, a recent study done by Bill Miller at the Bird and Bat Observatory up, in, uh, up at the Western Great Lakes Bird and Bat Observatory in Ozaki where uh, he looked at birds that are migrating along the coast, but migrating farther out uh, than the coastline. So he actually, his field participants got in, in small airplanes and, uh, and they, they flew little routes to see who, which birds were migrating offshore. Um, part of that is because there's potential for wind energy offshore and they kind of want to see how that would affect those migrants. But a lot of the migrants use the lake um, in the water farther out. Sometimes if you're there, you can see just like thousands and thousands of, of mergansers or cormorants uh, really far offshore. 
um, and some of them are even farther offshore than you can see with your binoculars. So, uh, yeah, the, the lake is super important, um, and, and, and a lot of north-south uh, features like bluffs or mountains, even I-94, uh, there's evidence that a lot of birds that particularly soar will use the heat effect from, from the pavement on the highway, which is constantly rising, um, and, and then they'll use that to kind of help them soar north or south, depending on wherever they're going when conditions are right. So I, I, that could be a whole talk. Um, so uh, excellent question. What's the sec second question? Second question is, um, what is the best time of day to go birding um, for a beginner? Um, is there a certain time of day that's the easiest to start? That's a really good question. So I like to, and I talked about this in my last talk, I like to listen for the dawn chorus. So I, again, I encourage, I really strongly encourage listening for birds and learning their calls and songs first. So I would say, if you like your bedroom cool, sleep with your window cracked open a little bit, uh, particularly now, and you'll start to hear what's nesting around you. Um, and, and particularly into June, you'll start to see who, who else is nesting around you. Um, birds are, the, the, the talk about the early bird getting the worm birds are most active in the morning. Um, so the soonest you can get out, uh, the better, but it, it also has to do with local weather patterns. Um, if, if it's a, if it's a, a foggy morning or a cloudy day, you might get birds that are more active at different times. Um, some birds are active throughout the, the day. And so there's really no easy way to, to answer that question other than try them all. Try, try getting up really early one morning, try getting up a little later, try going in the afternoon. You'll kind of see the patterns. It, it does ebb and flow and, and the middle of the day is probably the, the lowest um, time, but you can also get out night and look for owls. Uh, so again, two great questions with complex answers. Um, that might be the basis for future talks. Okay. Excuse me. And thank you for those questions, by the way. Um, so yeah, if it, again, just knowing, knowing your surroundings is really, really important. Um, and uh, I, I encourage you to you know, participate this Saturday if you can. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and, and, and get on the UEC website, uh, the backyard, backyard, UEC in your backyard campaign. Uh, there's a lot of really great videos. Um, and uh, Desiree, I don't know if that's your name or if that was just your computer name, but you mentioned there's a really excellent um, product coming out from one of our educators uh, that, that should be listed soon. That's just a really great, it's like a story map and, and how to, how to look for birds. So keep an eye on our website for good resources, um, which is actually my last tip here. So, uh, finding good resources. I, again, I, I would say the, the best resources you have, um, are your eyes and ears. And if your eyes and ears aren't functioning well, there's a lot of other ways, uh, to, to enjoy birds in particular. Um, I, I mentioned the journal is super important. Binoculars are important. Um, and, you know, and having a good field guide is, is, is a really good, uh, good tool, but there are, there are times when I'll go out birding and I'll leave the binoculars at home because that'll make me focus on some things. Um, there are times when I go birding and I leave the field guide at home because it'll make me focus on other things. Um, Ch uh, Chuck Hagner. Who's, who's local, is in Shorewood, um, just published this, this wonderful book, uh, Field Guide to the Birds of Wisconsin, so it'd be a great one to start with if you don't have it already. Uh, he'll be speaking at the center once, once we can do that again um, in signing books, and um, there's also for ID, there's, there's apps, so in the, in the lower left there's the Merlin Bird ID app. Um, eBird is just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful tool. Um, that I, I encourage you to catch one of Ethan's talks on eBird, um, and it's an important bird. 
a pertinent resource for science. Um, and then probably the, the most influential resource I've ever used is the Peterson birding by ear. Um, it's just, uh, it's just, it, it changed my world. It, it really allowed me to, to enjoy bird ID at a, at a different level. Um, and it's an, it's excellently arranged by kind of grouping birds. So it's not just alphabetical and you see here's the bird and this is what it sounds like. Um, so there's a lot of other resources out there. Uh, if you're buying binoculars, I do, I would encourage, um, you'll see them, they, they come with two numbers, like 10 by 50s or 8 by 40s or 8 by 20s or something like that. Uh, I, I think 8 by 40s are, are my favorite. The first number is magnification. So if it's a higher number, it's going to be a, a bigger image. Um, but it also adds weight to the binoculars. So an 8 by 40 versus a 10 by 50 um, is uh, 10 by 50s are going to give you a, a bigger image, but they're also a little bit clunkier. The, the next number is, is important too. The, that's the, the diameter uh, of the objective lens. And so a 40 millimeter objective lens um, is, is what you see here in that photo. And uh, that'll, that has to do with the brightness of your image. So when you see those really compact binoculars, those might be eight by 10s or eight by 15s or eight by 20s, which are, are great. But as soon as the light level outside starts to dim, the, the image brightness in those little compact ones tend to, tend to go pretty quickly. Uh, so, so the bigger the objective lens, the more light that's led in to see, to see the brightness of the image. But our, our pupils, the, the exit pupil, the, the opening in our eye is only five millimeter, five millimeters. And so through physics and all that fun magical stuff, if you take the second number and divide it by the first number, so eight by 40, 40 divided by eight is five. Um, that's as bright as your pupil can possibly observe. So if you had an eight by 100, it would appear just as bright to you as an eight by 40, because that's the max that your pupil light can let in. And actually that pupils, that, that exit pupil size actually shrinks as we get older. So when you're younger, you're able to see brighter images. As you get older, it gets a little less bright. Um, but, uh, but you want that ratio to be about five, the first number to the second number. You want the second number to be about the five times the first number. Uh, to let in the maximum brightness. So again, I can talk about that again later. It's, it's fun physiology stuff. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through some birds. If you are a birder, these these uh, these are your most basic birds. Um, so it's not it's not really kind of an ID class, but it's really uh, a chance to just kind of revisit if if you're starting from from scratch from square one. Um, you probably know some of these birds already, and if you finish, you know, once you finish here, you'll, you'll, you'll probably say to yourself, oh yes, I know at least 10 birds. Um, so again, this isn't meant to be an ID class, but it's just to kind of go through the birds that we can find on a regular basis in our backyards. Um, starting with the black cat chickadee, one of my absolute favorites. Uh, as with a lot of this birds, a lot of the birds in this list, um, I, I have a special fondness for them because they don't leave us when the going gets tough here in the winter. So in those dark February dreary days, um, you know they don't they don't just say see you later I'll see you back in the spring. Um, they stick it out with us, and to me I, it it just gives us like that that hardiness gives us like I don't know I, I just feel a little bit more tuned to them and, and grateful that they're they're sticking through it with us. Um, so the black cat chickadee, just a, a great bird to, to learn. They, they come to your feeders. If you look at, if you have a feeder, I encourage you to look at the behavior of the birds at your feeders. Chickadees have the tendency to come get a sunflower seed and then fly off with it, uh, whereas other birds will, will hang out at the cedar, feeder to eat. There's usually a hierarchy of species and you can try to figure that out. Um, and, and chickadees tend to be tend to be at the lower end, although they will chase off birds that are bigger than them. Uh, but they'll they'll come in, they'll get a seed, and then they'll fly off with it, either to eat it or to, to cache it or hide it for the future. 
Um, their mnemonics are for their song. There's a difference between songs and calls um, that uh, I will get into in, in future lectures, but uh, the song of the chickadee is chickadee dee dee dee. It says its name. There's evidence that the number of D's at the end of the chicka are uh, an indicate, indicator of how stressed that bird is. So a black capped chickadee that's that's hanging out and there's a red-tailed hawk nearby uh, is not going to be stressed. Red-tailed hawks do not catch chickadees. They're just like I said before. They're more brute strength. They're not. That's too small for them to, to try. They're too agile. But if that Cooper's hawk comes by, um, where maybe maybe the chickadee said chickadee for the red-tailed hawk, for that Cooper's hawk, they might be saying chickadee dee 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 dee. Like, hey, this is serious. We gotta we gotta pay attention here, family. Uh, or other birds um, and then I'm sorry that's so that's their call and their song is that that sweet whistle you hear again uh, usually in the spring and depending on who you talk to they're either saying hey sweetie or cheeseburger number two the American crow uh, one of the smartest birds, one of my favorite birds. Again, a bird that's here all year round, hanging out with us. Um, they, they are known to use tools. They pass culture on generationally uh, and in, in learning. And um, they also, one of my favorite things about them in the wintertime is their, is their huge roosts. I was walking through the Marquette University campus one evening and I just felt like this eerie, eeriness. I felt like something was going on and I, I didn't know what it was. I was all alone. Then I heard this wing flap uh, in one of the trees nearby and I looked up and then I realized that I was surrounded by probably more than 250 crows that I didn't know were there. Um, and, and so sometimes you'll see that particularly in winter, these huge roosts at uh, Washington Park right across the street from my house. Uh, I had over 300 uh, crows uh, just hanging out in the winter time, and those roosts are. There's a lot of benefits to the roosts for defense, for for information exchange. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of reasons that bird roosts, but it's something that fun to look for. They have that familiar craw uh, sound. They also do a chatter with just their bill that you may have heard. You may it, it kind of sounds like a squirrel. Uh, for all of these species, I'm going through kind of quickly. You can get on the internet and hear their calls and and see and and look in your field guides. Uh, but I'm going to kind of go through them quickly. Probably the most iconic bird, the American Robin, uh, Turdus migratoria, mi migratory. Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, it's a thrush and uh, it's, it's that iconic early bird gets the worm. They like to, they like to be in your backyard looking for worms um, and uh, very familiar, beautiful, beautiful sound, song. Uh, you may have heard their whinnying call as well, um, but but one of the easier birds to find uh, all year round. And in the wintertime, just like the crows, you'll see them in pretty big numbers, and you might not see them for a while, and uh, you know think that they've all gone and migrated. Uh, but robins are here all year round. In fact. I, I often get phone calls from people that are concerned because there's a robin in their backyard in January. Like, what, what can I do to help it? But robins are here year round. There are some that migrate, um, but they do tend to tend to uh, get together in these roosts again in the winter time, and you see them in, in much bigger numbers. American goldfinch, one of my, well, I guess they're, I'm going to say they're all one of my favorite birds, so maybe I'll just stop saying that. Uh, goldfinches are, we see them year round. But because they're short distance migrants, we're not seeing the same birds year round. So we see them all winter, but then our winter birds are actually going to migrate north and be replaced by the birds that were wintering south of here. So we see them year round, but it's not the same individuals in the summer as in the winter. But people call them the, um, the, uh, the wild canary in these parts. Um, they're like flying bananas. They fly like a roller coaster in an undulating motion up and down, flap glide, flap glide. Um, and, uh, and depending on who you listen to, they either say perchicory when they fly or potato chip, or uh, my friend Robin says they say uh, recidivist. Northern Cardinal, we talked about that a little bit earlier. 
uh, bird that's here year round. One of my favorite cardinal facts is that they start their courtship early because they are here year round. And they usually start to hear them singing around February 14th, which is Valentine's Day. So this, this bright red, beautiful bird um, that starts singing right around Valentine's Day. Uh, so, so listen for that in February next year. You start to hear them doing their beautiful, uh, beautiful calls. Um, super melodious, one of my favorites and uh, easy to find birds. The morning dove and I threw a pigeon in there for good measure. Uh, another bird that we can see very commonly um, and uh, and pigeons incidentally are they're not native to here um, but they've had a long relationship with humans when you look at at human history human cultures some of the earliest cultures have had uh, long relationships with with pigeons um, because of their their homing behavior um, their their racing pigeons their their they're pigeons that you display because you breed for them to have these crazy coats. And because of that long kind of domestic nature, you, you will see pigeons. This is kind of the traditional plumage, but you'll see white pigeons and, and uh, cream colored pigeons and dark pigeons. And, um, and, and that's all a result of that previous domestic breeding. Um, but, but they're all, all rock pigeons. Morning does have one of my favorite kind of haunting calls, uh, you know, you have to be quiet to hear it because it's, it's just very raspy, but beautiful, beautiful. Uh, the blue jay gets a bad rap, I think. It's, uh, it's also extremely intelligent. It's related to the crows. Uh, people kind of don't like them because they tend to be aggressive at the feeders. <clears throat> um, but man, when, when, when we were talking earlier about how, like, if you go ar around the world and see a bird um, that you've never seen before that's common to, to people in that community and you're like oh my god that is so beautiful and just imagine seeing this bird for the first time um, and and just how strikingly beautiful it is in fact through all of these birds as I'm going through them I try to like think of if I'd never seen them before and I looked at them for the first time I bet I would think totally differently about them because uh, it, either for their their striking plumage or their beautiful songs um, but Blue Jays also took a little bit of a hit with West Nile and are starting to work their way back up and very recognized bird uh, by kids and adults of all age, both their song and their call. And, you know, they say, Jay, Jay, Jay. Uh, Downy Woodpecker is, it's, uh, I'm going to talk about it tomorrow in my, in, in my talk about uh, the most commonly misidentified birds because the Downy Woodpecker has a, there's a, a a kind of cousin species, the hairy woodpecker, and they can be a little difficult to tell apart. Um, but I'm including the downy woodpecker here just because it is so common in the cities. Um, and it's a bird that easily to he easy to hear. And, when, and if you hear it, the song is, is actually, well, it's a, it's a kind of a song call mix. And it's quite a di bit different from the hairy woodpecker. So if you can hear it, it helps you. But there are some really easy tips that I'll talk about tomorrow about identifying the downy woodpecker versus the hairy woodpecker. But woodpeckers are fun and they're here, they're here year round um, and, uh, and familiar. Uh, finishing out here, I got the white-breasted nuthatch. Uh, looks similar to the chickadee, except it doesn't have that black bib on the, on the throat and uh, kind of has that upward turned bill uh, and its its job is to 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 go around the crevices of the bark and look for insects. Um, it has kind of a, a nasally song, and uh, it, it as I mentioned earlier, when it's when it's uh, foraging for insects, it, they tend to go down head first. Um, John Gerda just wrote a really good article in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel about about birding today, and and I think he called this bird a daredevil the way it just kind of head first goes down uh, the side of a tree. So the white-breasted nuthatch, it also has a cousin, the red-breasted nuthatch, uh, which are easy to t tell apart if you see them, a little harder to tell apart if you um, just hear them. And then finally, uh, our mates, 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 put on your tea kettle, let a little, the song sparrow. 
um, which we can see year round. They're much more common in the spring uh, and, and summer and fall. Um, but kind of that classic uh, sparrow pattern. Sparrows can be very difficult to ID, um, but just knowing that this is one of the most common sparrows uh, is half the battle. Half the battle. So if you see if you see a duck flying overhead, and if you say it's a mallard duck, you're going to be right 80% of the time, even if you hadn't seen the duck. Same with a, a hawk soaring over the freeway. You're going to it's it's almost always going to be a red-tailed hawk. And for the most part, if you see this sparrow in the city, uh, it's going to be a song sparrow, although that changes quite a bit during the migration. But but just knowing your chances, and and then you're looking for that that dark black spot um, on the chest is one of the telltale signs of the song sparrow. But the the most easily identified feature is that that beautiful song. So there's a few minutes left. Um, thank you for joining. Oh, I think I added one more as kind of an honorable mention because I didn't mention the house sparrow, but I'd be willing to bet that if any of you walked out of wherever you're, you're staying right now, uh, you'd, you'd hear or see one of these within a minute or less. Uh, these guys are everywhere, and um, I really come to really appreciate them more. They, they are invasive species, they can be aggressive, but globally their populations are starting to fall, and uh, they just have a really rich history with humans, and a really interesting natural history and behavior. So I've, I've this this stay at home is really uh, I've had the opportunity to study these guys a little bit more, and, and they're a lot of fun. So um, that's it for today.